Okay, so hopefully everyone can hear me. You're all very welcome uh, to our um, webinar series here within the observatory at Dublin City University. Uh, my name is Darren McCashin. Um, I'm chair of the observatory and assistant professor in the School of Psychology here at Dublin City University. Um, so we're really looking forward to this, um, this webinar today, looking at evidence-based toolkits for uh, addressing the many online harms that have been um, widely covered, certainly in, in the past two weeks here in Ireland and certainly afar, um, but with we'll particular focus on, on boys and men. So I'm just going to give you a one or two minute overview of, of what we're all about before handing over to our, our speakers. Um, we've two we've two speakers today who might kind of speak for around kind of 20 minutes each and then we'll have a, an overall discussion. Um, and my colleague, Dr. Catherine Baker, will be collating questions and themes that, that, that you might be discussing there in the chat. And hopefully we'll be finished on time at two o'clock or maybe just after. Um, one of the slides I shared the last webinar was this, which was this kind of uh, narrative that was uh, that we were seeing in, 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 in the media throughout 2023, which is this, what do we do in response to the many online harms, but specifically a lot of focus on, on certain influencers. Um, and this has begged the question, what do we actually do? Uh, so rather than always talking about the, the many harms and, and the dark side of things, it's very useful to think about what can we actually do in a solution focused way and, and what are constructive things that are happening across research uh, and society that we can bring to our audience to, to help uh, to help address these issues. And indeed, this is one of the remits of the of the observatory. Uh, so we're based here at the Anti-Bullying Centre, which is a, a research institute in Dublin City University. And the observatory itself was founded and, and, and funded uh, in response to the introduction of COCO's law here in Ireland. And you may be interested in checking out some of the reports uh, and, and, and prior uh, webinars that we posted, um, as well as some of the ongoing research that we have uh, on all things online harms that may, may be of interest to you. But as I said, today we're gonna to focus on this one particular area. Uh, and we're delighted to have uh, two guests with us here today, uh, Dr. Fiona O'Rourke, uh, a research associate at the University of Liverpool and uh, criminologist Dr. Uh, Emily Setti, both of whom have really applied research experience in this area and will be able to share lots of wisdom. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Fiona O'Rourke to kick us off. And Fiona, you have a, about 20 minutes. The floor is yours. And then we'll hand over to Emily and then maybe we'll we'll have a, a kind of a, a, a panel chat after that. So. Floor is yours. Thanks, Darren. I'll just yeah, I'll just commence now. Um great. Okay, so Thanks to Catherine and Dara for inviting Craig and I to present our work at this webinar. Unfortunately, Craig couldn't be here today and he sends his apologies. Um, in this presentation, I'll be talking about an educational toolkit that emerged from a research project Craig and I conducted, which was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK. This project culminated in the Men for Change Toolkit, which is an evidence-based educational resource designed to engage young men in recognizing, tackling and preventing harmful sexual and gender-based norms and behaviors in their online and offline peer groups. This project had three UK-based stakeholders, Survivors Network, Metro and Beyond Equality, who were all concerned with tackling and preventing sexual and gender-based harassment and violence. So this is a brief overview of the presentation. I'll begin by speaking about the research that underpins and informs the Men for Change Toolkit. I'll then progress on to speaking about our key research findings, which helped us to identify priorities for intervention that were used to inform the development of the toolkit. I'll show some sample workshops from this resource that critically examined sexual and gender-based abuse, including misogyny, and I'll briefly speak about facilitating these workshops. I'll conclude by outlining some safeguarding issues that should be considered when delivering these workshops. 
So the research project emerged in 2017, a time when there were conflicting reports, which are ongoing, about the forms of masculinity young hetero men in the UK and elsewhere perform in their peer groups. On the one hand, inclusive masculinity scholars like Eric Anderson, whose book you can see on the left of the slide, have argued that young hetero men in Anglophone countries, including the UK, are more likely than older generations to practice progressive inclusive forms of masculinity which undermine gendered hierarchies and discriminatory practices like misogyny. However, in recent decades, a number of media reports, some of which you can see on the slide, have revealed how groups of young men in the UK, including self-identified lads, engage in misogynistic forms of masculinity that include threatening and or perpetrating sexual abuse, harassment and violence against women. In some cases, we can see misogynies intersecting with other discriminatory practices, including racism. As the headlines on the slide indicate, these practices manifest in many UK-based social institutions, including schools, universities, and law enforcement agencies. Some of these headlines draw attention to the role that digital technologies and forms of, of communication, like social media posts and WhatsApp private group chats are playing facilitating these practices. However, the way in which digital technologies and forms of, of communication facilitate and mediate the interactions of young hetero men in the UK remains under-researched and there are a lack of interventions to mitigate harmful practices. So our research aimed to address this gap. So a key aim of the project was to conduct research about gender norms and behaviours within young men's online spaces, particularly those associated with laddish identities and cultures in the UK, and then to use key findings to develop an educational intervention which works to tackle and prevent harmful norms and behaviours. We employed qualitative research methods to conduct this research and we conducted 15 focus groups with men, women and gender diverse people who were located across the UK, which involved 82 participants aged 18 to 25 years. These focus groups were organised according to gender and sexual orientation and you can see more information about them on the slide. Follow up um, interviews were conducted with 29 respondents and data collection and analysis was conducted between April 2020 and September 2022. So I'm now going to provide an outline of the key research findings from this study that underpin and inform the Men for Change toolkit. I'll focus on key themes that emerge in the data, which primarily focus on examining the relationship between young men, masculinity and laddishness from the perspective of cisgender or hetero men. I'll specifically look at social dynamics and relations between cisgender or hetero men and men women relations. Due to time constraints, I'm not going to be able to explore these findings in great depth as I'll be devoting a significant amount of the presentation to the Men for Change Toolkit. Uh, for more detailed information about the research findings I discuss in this presentation, please see the open access publication that features on the slide, which we have put into the chat. So before I proceed, I want to point out this presentation does make reference to sexual and gender-based abuse, harassment and violence, including sexual assault and rape. So a key finding of our research is that men-only spaces can enable research participants, including self-identified lads, to form and develop positive, respectful and emotionally close relationships with one another. However, harmful gendered and sexual norms and behaviours, including misogyny, can dominate these spaces. Research participants spoke about observing and or engaging in misogynistic practices, including non-consensually sharing sexual images of teenage girls and or women, rating teenage girls and our women's perceived sexual attractiveness, body shaming teenage girls and our women, and sexual dares that demean and sexually objectify teenage girls and our women. These findings indicate that while young hetero men in our study can have positive and respectful relationships with one another, they did not always put this into practice in their attitudes and behaviours towards women. Our study found that the characteristics of online communication, including 24-7 connectivity, and the ability to rapidly share online content such as texts in men-only private group chats via digital technologies and devices can facilitate, mediate and conceal misogyny. In the interview extract you can see on the slide, a young man describes some of these dynamics. He states, men talking about women in a negative way, like saying sexual things about them, it's less acceptable now. So it has to happen in private, like in WhatsApp group chats, for them to feel comfortable saying those things. So it's important to point out that young hetero men who took part in this study participate in these misogynistic behaviours to varying degrees. Some do not participate in them and are very critical of them, but they did not always know how to call them out in their peer groups. Some research participants acknowledge that they ignored misogynistic comments or banter in their peer groups because they want to fit in and they do not want to be excluded. 
Folks group discussions and interviews with some young hetero men in their mid twenties indicated that their attitudes to and willingness to engage in misogynistic forms of masculinity in their peer groups, such as non-consensual sexting can change over time. For instance, some young men in long-term relationships did not share sexual images of their girlfriends with their male friends as they recognized that this would be wrong and would have serious adverse ramifications for them. However, some of these participants admitted that they were still in men-only private group chats with people in their 20s, 30s and older where these practices continued and they did not call them out because of the close relationships they had with them. So these findings point to a number of priorities for intervention which we needed to address. Firstly, they indicated that there is a need to work to engage young hetero men in recognizing, tackling and preventing harmful sexual and gendered attitudes and behavior in their peer groups that target women. To maximize engagement, our findings suggested that masculinity and lad culture should not be characterized in, in exclusively negative terms, which would likely alienate men. Instead, interventions should aim to acknowledge the positives of men only spaces like all male friendship groups, which can enable men to form positive, respectful and emotionally close relationships with one another, whilst raising critical awareness of harmful sexual and gendered attitudes and behaviors associated with them. Our findings also indicated that these interventions should work to support young men in critically reflecting on their own behavior and that of their peers, and consider the extent to which it maintains or challenges harmful gendered and sexual attitudes and behaviors. There's also a need, of course, for interventions to promote attitudinal and behavioral change within young men if this is necessary. And there's also a need to equip young men with active bystander intervention skills that would enable them to tackle harmful gendered and sexual behaviors in their peer groups in ways that mitigate social marginalization and exclusion. So we use these findings to develop the Men for Change Toolkit, which is an educational resource that has a range of practical tools youth leaders can use to support young men aged 18 to 25 years in thinking critically about masculinity and in recognizing, tackling and preventing harmful gendered norms and behaviors in their online and offline peer groups. As indicated by the name, Men for Change, this resource aims to support those working to be positive agents of change for gender equality with their, within their communities. Before I discuss some of the workshops and took it, it's important to point out that they explore gender and masculinity in socio-cultural terms. For instance, they recognize harmful gendered and sexual norms and behaviors within UK-based youth cultures and elsewhere as reflecting and reifying those in the broader socio-cultural context. In other words, these harmful norms and behaviors are not intrinsic to specific gendered bodies, such as those identified as men, women, or gender diverse people. They're learned behaviors that can be unlearned and the workshops in the took it aim to support this process. More specifically, the workshops aim to enable young men to develop knowledge, values, attitudes and skills that would support them in thinking about masculinities and how they can recognize, tackle and prevent harmful sexual and gender norms and behaviors in their peer groups and elsewhere via interactive participatory activities, group discussions and peer to peer learning and skills building. So the toolkit, which is 236 pages long, has 16 workshops, which are spread across four sections. Each section explores specific themes that relate to gender masculinities of young men, including sexual and gendered norms and behaviors that target women. The workshops are particularly concerned with exploring those that exist within hetero masculine spaces, as our research found that these were a key priority to address within the toolkit. Each workshop in the toolkit has a workshop plan that outlines the information required to deliver its content, which is structured under a number of titles you can see on the screen that include learning objectives, key messages, individual and group activities, discussion topics, debriefing and conclusion. You can see a sample workshop plan on the slide. I'll now give uh, you a brief overview of some of the workshops that can be used to critically examine harmful gender norms and behaviours, including those associated with misogyny. Within the time limits of the presentation, I'm only going to be able to show you a limited number of workshops and resource sheets. So as I indicated, a key priority for our interventions is to engage young men in recognizing and tackling um, harmful gender norms and behaviors in their peer groups. While conducting our research, we found that the men we spoke to often had little or no experience of talking about gender masculinity and how they had learned to be a man through various forms of socialization. So we developed workshops in the toolkit that explore basic concepts that relate to gender and masculinity, such as how gender norms and power dynamics in UK society, and elsewhere are produced via social institutions like the media. You can see some of these resource sheets on the slide. 
which asked participants to explore how messages about masculinity are communicated via various media, such as toys, video games, and social, social media in ways that often link men and masculinity with power, control, and domination. Participants are asked to question these power dynamics and to critically reflect on their relationship to them and the various ways they can impact on their relationship to people from other gendered backgrounds, including women, which aims to motivate them to become more critical of these dynamics. Section two is titled Masculinity, Young Men and Friendships. Workshops in this section explore some of the gendered norms and behaviours within young men's peer groups and consider how participants can challenge harmful practices like gender-based abuse, harassment and violence. You can see the title of the workshops on the slide and the various issues that are covered. I'm now going to look at a workshop and resource sheets from this section. So as I've already indicated, a key finding from our research is that while men only spaces can enable research participants, including self-identified lads, to form and develop positive, respectful and emotionally close relationships with, with one another, they can also be spaces where gender-based abuse, including misogyny, can dominate. So to address this workshops in section two, critically examine these harmful gender norms and behaviours and explore how young men can recognise and challenge gender-based abuse if they occur in these spaces. The workshop begins by exploring some of the positives of male friendship groups, such as the role they can play in giving people a sense of belonging and emotional support. Workshops then use scenarios that represent different forms of gender-based abuse, including misogyny, that participants may encounter in their peer groups and use them as the basis for a discussion about what they feel is acceptable or unacceptable behaviour within their peer groups. The slide features a scenario that explores online misogynistic influencers. Participants are asked how they'd respond in these scenarios, which aims to prompt discussions about the most appropriate way to respond and what they would do if they are in a similar real life situation. The adverse impact of gender-based abuse is explored using impact statements written by people who've been subjected to this behaviour, which aims to increase workshop participants' ability to empathise with them and to challenge such behaviours. These activities aim to promote behaviour change and our willingness to challenge gender-based abuse in their peer groups and elsewhere. Workshops also explore active bystander strategies participants can use to tackle gender-based abuse in their online and offline peer groups. Workshops in section three critically examine sexual and gendered norms and behaviours within young men's heteromasculine peer groups and explore how they can recognise, tackle and prevent harmful practices like non-consensual sexting if they occur in these spaces. You can see from the slide the topics explored within the workshop for this section. I'll now show you some sample workshops and resource sheets. So as I've already indicated, a key finding from our research is that young hetero men often observe and are engaged in harmful sexual talk or behaviour in their private group chats, such as body shaming women and non-consensually sexing images of them. And they do not always understand the negative impact of this behaviour or take action to tackle it. To address this, we developed a workshop that critically examines how young men talk about sex in their private group chats in ways that aim to support them in recognising, tackling and preventing harmful sexual practices and their negative impacts. This workshop uses scenarios which represent different ways of talking about sex in private group chats as the basis for a discussion about what participants feel is harmful or harmless behaviour and how they'd respond in such scenarios. You can see some of these on the slide. Participants are asked to identify harmful practices such as rape jokes or non-consensual sex and to consider their negative impacts. They're encouraged to reflect on their own private group chats in ways that aim to enable them to become more critical of harmful practices and thus more willing to challenge them. Impact statements written by people who've been subjected to harmful sexual talk and behaviour are used to examine the negative impacts of this behaviour which aims to support participants in better understanding their negative impacts and to empathise with those who've been subjected to this behaviour. By so doing, these impact statements aim, aim to promote behaviour change within participants if this is required and to increase their willingness to challenge harmful sexual talk and behaviours in their private group chats. Um, as I've already indicated, our research found that young hetero men often observe and or engage in non-consensual sexting in their private group chats. So to, to address this, workshops in the toolkit explore what sexual consent is and how to practice it online and offline. You can see some of the resource sheets from this workshop on the slide and the various stages they take. Firstly, participants are asked to respond to scenarios that explore their views and what sexting practices they feel are consensual or non-consensual which is used to open up discussions about what sexual behaviour they feel is consensual. The next stage explores what sexual consent is, how to practice it and what that looks like. 
And the final stage explores various ways that non-consensual sexting can be tackled in peer groups. This workshop also provides information about UK-based laws that relate to sexual consent, which aims to ensure participants are aware of them. The workshops in the toolkit also explore how to challenge harmful sexual language and behavior using various scenarios. You can see one of these on the resource sheet on the slide, which shows someone receiving a message about um, making a joke about rape and then indicating how to challenge that behavior by questioning how a joke about sexual violence could be funny. These scenarios aim to support young men in knowing how they can strategically call out harmful sexual comments and behaviors in their peer groups and show example of how, examples of how to do so. So who should facilitate uh, Men for Change workshops? As I've said, the toolkit has been designed for UK-based um, youth leaders who have experience engaging young men aged 18 to 25 years in critical discussions about masculinity. Beyond Equality, a UK-based organisation have such facilitators, and uh, we recommend those interested to contact them about the work they do. It's important to point out that given the sensitive nature of some of the issues explored within the Toolkit's workshops, which include gender-based abuse and sexual violence, that workshop facilitators should have the professional skills and experiences required to deliver them to young people in a safe and considered way. This would involve experience in dealing with personal disclosures, having knowledge of relevant safeguarding policies and procedures in their respective institutions and organizations, and signposting workshop participants to relevant advice and support services. And the annex section of the toolkit provides a range of advice and support sheets, which you can see on the slide. So that's the end of my presentation. I've put my contact details on the slide and more information about the project, which I've put into the chat. I've also put in web links, the toolkit and a related resource, a uh, research paper people can access and some additional resources, which I hope are, hope are, are helpful. Back to you, Dara, thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Fiona. Um, lots to chew on there and I'll hand over to Emily who might wanna set up as we, um, as we just transition over. And at the end of both presentations, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a chat and then we'll collate any questions. And just a reminder to anyone who wants to, Get a question in to use our chat function there or the Q&A function rather. OK, um, the floor is yours, Emily. Thank you so much. And yeah, I'm really great to be here. So, um, yeah, grateful for the invitation. Um, what I'm going to be talking to you about today is this toolkit that I um, co-designed based on some research conducted with Life Lessons UK about um, boys and young men's perspectives on the education that they'd received about sexual consent. And um, this project was quite broad and dealt with consent in a general sense, both online and offline. Um, and I'll be talking about um, the online in particular, but then kind of contextualizing that in terms of what we learned from the boys about consent in general. Um, the underlying research conducted with Life Lessons was just about the boys and young men's perspectives on what they had been taught and the formats in which they'd received that education. And subsequent to that, um, that research um, I carried out in 2022, subsequent to that in 2023, um, myself and a couple of others, uh, Jeremy Indyker um, and Will Hudson, did um, some workshops with teenage boys um, to understand how to address some of the weaknesses of the consent education they'd received, some of the challenges um, in educating boys um, about these topics um, in order to produce um, what resulted in this toolkit, this guidance for educators um, for use um, in the classroom and maybe other settings um, which might kind of better meet the needs of boys and address some of the challenges um, that they described experiencing um, both with consent generally as a topic, but also with engaging in education on this topic. So, OK, um, in terms of our rationale um, as to how we kind of approach the research and the toolkit development, um, you know, this understanding of the importance of teaching about consent, both as a way of preventing sexual harm and um, encouraging kind of reporting and, and better quality responses to instances of sexual harm, um, but also very much as a way of foregrounding what it means to have healthy and positive relationships and sexual experiences um, for young people. I think a lot of the education that is delivered to young people about relationships and sex education generally um, can focus on harm prevention um, and the risk and deficit models and discourses um, around young people's sexual experiences and their 
relationships and this idea of how can we educate in a way that actually focuses on um, the positive and about the idea that sex and relationships can be um you know a, a kind of positive experience for young people not just about harm reduction um, the house of why we do what we do um, within this space, I think what we see is quite a lot of focus on information transfer, um, you know, provision of information and trying to increase young people's knowledge, say, of topics around consent. Um, and then somewhat around the skills that they might need to translate that information and knowledge into practice. And I've been troubled for quite some time really about the model that we use around what constitutes consent and the skills that are needed. Um, typically young people um, in schools are taught about what the law says around consent and what they have to be looking for and doing um, in those regards with also then a kind of additional layer of affirmative consent. So the notion that the law requires free and informed consent given with capacity and then affirmative consent being about that yes means yes, no means no, and that you should be um, you know, pursuing sexual experiences predicated on clear and direct communication um, of that yes consent um, given freely and with capacity um, and so on. Um, for direct relevance to today, um, the online sexual imagery um, and young people kind of producing and sharing sexual images with each other has been very much framed within that legal construct of, um, you know, you as an under 18 do not have capacity um, to consent legitimately to participate in these behaviours, therefore it is de facto against the law for you to do so. Um, and so consent on any more kind of nuanced level um, is not being unpicked in a consistent way, I would say, um, in schools. It's very much do not engage in these behaviours. They are illegal by definition. And we can contrast that with other forms of sexual behaviour that young people might be engaging with, whereby, um, you know, consent is maybe dealt with um, in a bit more of a kind of nuanced and specific way. So this is very much being done by schools um, in England, where I conducted this research under um, the guidance that has been issued by the Department for Education that talks about what young people should know by the end of secondary school in terms of laws pertaining to different forms of abusive behaviour um, and the role of consent within that. Um, and then this idea of communicating and interpreting consent, upholding the rights to withdraw consent at any stage of the process. But then, like I say, um, the sexual imagery and the online sexual behaviours are very much being predicated um, around that prohibition, abstinence-based approach to it is just illegal um, by definition. And that very much not just being a legal set of risks that young people are deemed to face, um, but also... Um, risks of abuse that might unfold through participation in those illegal behaviors so if you produce and share an image of yourself then you know there is the potential for that image to be distributed more widely and for other forms of abuse and harassment to be um, perpetrated towards you so very much that idea of you are breaking the law by sharing the image and you're putting yourself at risk of further harm um, but the idea then within all of this landscape that young people are meant to be being taught about what constitutes sexual harassment and sexual violence and that, um, you know, consent is something that has to be communicated and interpreted on a skills based level, empathy, perspective taking, clear and direct communication and what to do. Um, if you find yourself experiencing abusive or harmful behaviours based on a violation of consent and where you can get support with that, including if that is happening in an online environment. Now, we approach this research with a bit of a critical lens around some of what young people are being taught. And when that comes to their online sexual behaviours, we know that a great deal of research and theoretical kind of argumentation is out there around the need to very carefully disentangle consensual and non-consensual behaviours and not just to be giving um, very kind of blunt messaging around everything being illegal and equally as problematic. Actually, there is a distinction between volitional and self-directed and consensual sharing, even at that adolescent kind of age group, with what might be 
um, defined as abusive and harmful sharing. And that not only are we failing to equip young people with the ability to make those distinctions, and that can feed into some of the victim blaming and the problems that we've seen um, unfold within peer groups in response to abuse, but also it might be, well, we know for a fact it it, it can inhibit reporting. Um, I've recently done research with the police um, whereby we have identified that um, young people being told that everything they do in this space is illegal um, is then preventing victims of abuse from coming forward and talking about their experiences and um, because they're concerned about self-incrimination um, because they have supposedly broken the law to begin with by just participating um, in these behaviours regardless of um, any dynamics of consent at play. Um, as um, Fiona also um, touched upon, um, finding more and more with boys and young men in particular, but also some of the girls um, that um, I've spoken to, that we are not seeing a reduction in harm and abuse. What we are seeing uh, is detection and punishment avoidance. So, for example, teenage boys have told me that rather than digitally forward an image of a girl to their peer, um, instead they will just show um, the peer, the friend, and um, the image on their phone. So they're still engaging in the non-consensual unethical behaviour, but they're doing so in a way that will stop them getting into trouble. And that being because of that legal punishment, risk, deficit model framing that we see um, as really kind of pervading education in this space. Of course, I'll caveat that there is some very good quality education being delivered that does break down some of this and does push back on those narratives. But if we just look at the kind of Department for Education guidance that's being put out to schools around this, um, it does not necessarily lend itself um, to that kind of nuance. So this is how we entered the field. Um, also, and I'll kind of come back to this at the end, um, I have become more and more um, critical of the use of very kind of simplistic and straightforward narratives um, to convey education about consent in the classroom. Um, we see scholars critiquing that very kind of rationalistic, affirmative consent, yes means yes, it's just as simple as that. Um, and the cup of tea video that, that some of you may be familiar with, um, that was never intended for use in the classroom. It was developed for very different purposes, but being used to really hammer home this message that consent is simple. Just listen out for that yes, say yes or no, depending on what you want, and there we go, job done. So that was all where we were coming from. And we, when we were working with the young people, so this is a teenage boy who participated in the workshop, and he really criticised the use of that very simplistic um, kind of messaging um, to the point where he was saying, you know, just stop showing these kinds of resources um, in the classroom. Um, it's not being used to start a conversation about the nuances and complexities of consent. It's actually just used to say, right, simple as that, job done, moving on. Um, and that idea of simplifying things, I, we can completely understand why educators might want to do that. And the um, kind of well-intentioned ideas around presenting this stuff in the classroom, but that very much being the crux of the issue, because yeah, the boys can nod along and think, okay, it will make sense in theory, um, but in practice, not remotely helpful, and they can become quite cynical and disengaged um, from that type of education. So this really reflects what we found in the underlying research. So um, there's a link to um, one of the publications on the study there that, that well, not a link, but but kind of a, um, you know, a, 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 the, the citation there that you can go and kind of dig into there if you want to read more about it. But we worked with a few different types of schools. We did... Um, well, focus groups and interviews with boys about the consent education that they've received, how they felt about it, what they learned from it, and the extent to which they found it helpful or otherwise. And like I say, reaffirm this idea of consent being taught as like this legal thing, and this is what the law says, this is affirmative consent, and so on. Sorry, my dog has just decided that he wants to start barking at this right moment, so apologies if you can hear that. Hopefully he will be quiet in a minute. Um, but yes, so the boy is very much um, understanding the law, being able to repeat the law, to talk about a confirmative consent. That knowledge information transfer had been successful. We can tick the box. They understood that. 
Um, they had interpreted that as consent being a transactional dynamic, whereby they as boys were initiators of sex, of sex and therefore responsible for obtaining consent. They often othered the perpetration of non-consensual sexual activity, both online and offline, to irresponsible boys and young men who intentionally violate or undermine girls' rights um, to consent, and they distanced themselves from these behaviours. They wanted to do the right thing, but they were very anxious and concerned about consent. They... Um, felt that there were a lot of power dynamics and gray areas that might mean on the one hand that a direct clear yes might not always be present or no um, if it's non-consent, but also um, on the other hand, that even if direct communication is present, it's not necessarily reliable because people might agree to things that they don't really want to do and that there are various pressures at play that they as boys might not even be cognizant of in that sexual environment, pressures coming from outside of the environment and that includes in an online domain so negotiating what is meaningful and consensual in terms of online sexual behaviors whereby there might be those invisible pressures um, and power dynamics and some of the boys framed that around this problem of false accusations um, that I hear every single time I sit down and talk to groups of boys they want to talk about false accusations by which they refer to malicious allegations that they think are occurring but more generally, the idea that breakdowns in communication can happen because of grey areas and power dynamics. And this very much being framed around heterosexual dynamics being risky by definition, and that unintentional harm might resolve, might, might emerge from the idea that boys and girls are different, the way they communicate is different, the pressures they feel are different, and therefore they are at risk from each other. And when asking about like same-sex dynamics, the idea being, well, you know, they're more similar, um, the pressures and, and all of that don't unfold in quite the same way. Um, that then being pushed back on by some of the um, same sex um, boy, attractive boys that um, were participating in this. But yeah, false accusations then not necessarily being intentional lies, but about grey areas and miscommunication. And this was something that we recommended to educators in the toolkit. You know, if you hear boys make claims of risk and false accusations, it's very easy to push back and challenge that as like not necessarily actually a factual reality of a risk that they face. And, you know, criminologists working within um, the justice system, I'm very aware that you do not have, you know, many men and boys sitting in prison off the back of false accusations. Actually, the reality is, is quite the reverse of that. But speaking to boys about um, actually, what are the anxieties and insecurities that sit underneath some of these claims um, of risk and really unpicking that from a kind of social and emotional level and also boys right to consent. That's not really getting a look in. They are the initiators of sex, of sex and therefore the potential perpetrators of harm. And some of the boys were very troubled by that because they would talk about experiences of sexual harm, including in online environments that they had experienced but weren't necessarily being captured um, un, un, under any um, of these dynamics, let alone then um, what same-sex attractive boys um, were feeling very marginalised um, from this discourse. So in terms of what we tried to do with the toolkit, we co-produced it with the with, with a different group of boys, um, uh, older boys. The boys we spoke to in the underlying research were aged 13 to 18, and we went across the year group um, at secondary school level. The boys who participated in the workshop were at age 16, 17, 18, and we presented these findings to them, and we worked through ways of how can we actually move on um, the educational landscape to really get at some of these complexities um, from a more socio-emotional level, not just a kind of legal level. So... What the toolkit um, does um, on this kind of participatory um, like process, what it resulted in was very much disentangling the role of the law in guiding sexual behavior. We phrase the law or frame the law as very much a minimum standard of behavior, a legal backstop that you need in a democratic society. It does not answer all possible scenarios, it cannot be used to guide ethical behaviour. It is very much a kind of bare minimum standard for behaviour. Behaviour might be legal, but it might still be unethical and problematic. And also a lot of the boys speaking to us about this idea of you do not 
want to just say, how do I get out of trouble legally? It goes back to that idea of positive, healthy interactions and relationships. How can we inspire a better quality set of interactions, not just avoidance of getting into legal trouble? Just like what we've seen with the boys who will share pictures of their phones, um, of, of girls on their phones with each other. That's about not getting into trouble. And some of the boys talking about like, do you sign a contract for consent? Do you engage in these behaviours in your relationships? And kind of pushing back on that idea that relationships should be about more than just not getting into trouble. But when educating about the law, being honest about the full reality of the law. So not just the letter of the law, but the way in which the law will actually unfold and the idea that it's not always black and white. A legal case might result in a certain outcome because that's about evidence. It's not about who is telling the truth and who's lying and really pushing back on that binary understanding. And that, I think, definitely relates to online sexual image sharing. Teachers and schools are being taught told to educate about the law on sexual image sharing well the law on sexual image sharing encompasses a whole bunch of outcome codes that the police use to not proceed legally if cases of consensual image sharing come to their attention and young people in schools are not being educated about that so if we're going to educate about the law we have to do so holistically and in full in ways that actually inspire ethical online sexual conduct not just everything you do online is potentially illegal um and that is actually now um embedded within policing practice um as a way of inspiring ethical conduct and disentangling consensual versus non-consensual sharing but also as a way of encouraging victims of abuse to come forward those outcome codes exist so that victims do not run the risk of incrimination if they report their experiences and that is vital to implement in educational strategy um, around education about online sexual image sharing but like i say it should be about focusing on ethical sexual conduct and what the work um the toolkit does is bridges the knowledge and information that we want to convey to young people with those skills and emotional literacy that they will need to put that knowledge and information into practice so it is not enough just to tell young people these facts we need to talk to them about why we might have this knowledge and behave differently yes means yes no means no but why might someone say yes when they don't mean it why might a person not feel able to say no let's talk about and disaggregate some of those pressures some of those power dynamics and at root in the toolkit is how do we create spaces within our relationships in order for consent communication to unfold in a different way how do we not just focus on not getting into trouble and not getting arrested and what are our rights and responsibilities around that to exactly what spaces are we creating with our partners that are healthy and positive. So yeah, socio-emotional literacy, not just risk and punishment avoidance, and actually looking at learning outcomes. There might not actually be a right answer. We might not be able to tick the box in terms of what has the cup of tea video taught us about consent. Actually, what it might have taught us is consent, be it online or offline, is not actually as simple as a yes or a no. We might leave the classroom feeling more confused than we felt before we went in. And that's not a problem, actually. That idea of reflection, of grey areas, of the fact that two people in an environment might have very different perceptions of the same event, that is actually a positive outcome because it enables perspective taking and empathy. We said to the boys during the workshop, you know, if you're feeling confused, then maybe so is your partner. How can we use recognition of that to encourage ethical conduct, mutual orientation towards each other, rather than the hostile winner takes all, who's responsible, who's going to get into trouble, who's lying, who's telling the truth? How can we break down some of that, 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 that binary understanding? And what our toolkit hopefully does is present different scenarios um, that the boys can use to work through some of this and also center their own consent and the situations in which they might agree to things that they aren't necessarily comfortable with. So in that regard, if we're going to use media to deal with some of this, and I linked to an article that I recently wrote with Johnny Hunt um, on this very topic, we must do so not as an end in itself, like I think is going on with the cup of tea video, but very much as a means to an end. So this is what you know, a certain depiction of consent is looking like, here's some messaging, 
right, you know, why might it not necessarily work like this in practice? What do we need to do to disentangle it in a more nuanced way? So yeah, leave it there. That's me. Obviously, feel free to look into more um, about what I've done here um, in this space um, on the links there. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Emily. And both, both of you had an impeccable timing, 20 minutes on the dot. So, so thank you for that. It's always hard to squeeze this in, into, into a lunchtime. But um, I often like to ask both speakers even to reflect on, on, on each other's work. And you might even want to scan some of the questions that are there. Obviously, you are working with um, different age groups, but a lot of similarities there in terms of impressively that co-design element of you know, speaking with young people first and then going on to the the development of those materials. I was just wondering, did you have any reflections on, on each other's work? You're on mute there. So, yeah, I mean, I obviously follow Emily's work um, and read her blogs and research papers and everything. And I know we've, we have presented at uh, similar events in the past. Um, yeah, certainly the co-designing um, educational resources with young people um, is has been extremely important um, for uh, Craig and I, has been a vital part of the education resource we developed. Um, really interesting to see that Emily has, um, has taken the same approach. Um, for us, yeah, we found that it was very valuable in the sense that it enabled us to find out, you know, just what language was being used in young people's peer group. Um, in some cases, we needed to do a lot of catching up. Um, we had, you know, terms, we came across terms that we weren't really um, very familiar with um, um, initially, and we had to learn about, and I'd be interested in hearing from um, Emily in terms of, uh, did you did you have similar findings in your own work in terms of you know finding out what what sort of language was was being used by by the young people you were working with and how you tailored your your resources in response to that how, how did how did it inform um the approach that you took um yeah, sure. No. Um, and likewise, obviously, follow your work um, and, you know, big fan of everything you're doing um, in this sort of space. And I think it's really in, like the, the sort of I know we're looking at different age groups, but I think that's actually really complementary because what I found so interesting about your work is like that continuation of like the male peer group kind of power dynamics at play um, and the way in which that can affect young men's behaviors in ways that they might not necessarily endorse or even feel particularly powerful through um but nevertheless it is an articulation of power and something that i've been trying to disentangle here is 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 what's the difference between that performance of power versus feeling powerful and a lot of the teenage boys that i speak to will say that they don't feel particularly powerful and you know and i and i and i do feel that idea of adolescent young men yeah that that you can't some find a more insecure troubled kind of cohort of of young men and i think we need to hear that and but then how that then sort of manifests as power plays at that wider level that can then become very exploitative and harmful so it'd be interesting to hear what you think a little bit like about that as well um but also um yeah on your point about language i think um what I've found um, in a general sense is that kind of like the way in which the language of young men is policed because of how it is deemed harmful by like its very nature. But then sort of how kind of counterproductive that can be in terms of the way in which boys in terms of my age group then feel very shut down and like all oh, you're policing us and you're just not allowing us to say certain things and how can we actually harness the language that they use to then unpick critically sort of why it's problematic so like with the narrative of false accusations being very much a hook onto which they hung their insecurities around risk but then that being shut down as like, well, that's factually inaccurate. You don't actually face these risks of full sexations. OK, yeah, fine. That might be true. But we're not really connecting boys about what that terminology really means to them. Um, and so, yeah, I'm thinking the struggle of like, how do you do that, like in a safe and appropriate way? How do you challenge their language at the same time as really understand what that language means to them? 
Um, and it is something I'm like thinking more about basically. Um, so not probably a very good answer <laughs> there, um, but like it's the challenge, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I have found it really useful to hear, you know, your presentations, the one that I've um, heard today and other previous presentations you've given about some of the challenges that um, the boys you've um, spoken to have experienced just in terms of, you know, their need to understand what sexual consent is. It's not, you know, this clear cut um, definition that's that's sometimes given um, in, you know, uh, an educational context um, is not always easily translatable, you know, within real life sexual situations. Um, and helping them to understand and supporting them and understanding, you know, how that that can play out equipping them with the you know the right language to to use in those situations um is i think extremely extremely valuable and the resources that you've produced to to support that process are are obviously like um you know really great um also this this struggle that you this challenge that you um refer to there just in terms of um the emotional or affective dimension sometimes to these situations and some situations, you know, the language that, that can be used in, in these situations uh, needs to be critiqued. Um, what we have come across um, while conducting our research was that sometimes there can be a degree of defensiveness. Um, and sometimes even when the question of you know, their relationships to women and how they relate to women um, and how that, you know, can manifest in a number of different spaces, including their, you know, private chat groups or their, you know, uh, men only spaces or, you know, nightclubs or pubs or whatever. Um, we found initially that when we, you know, brought up that question, you know, in some in some groups, you know, there was a lot of defensiveness. And I know we've we, we've spoken uh, we've spoken about that in the past before. So figuring out ways to you know work through that defensiveness um while you know listening empathetically to points that are being made you know by by the people who are speaking um i think yeah is, is extremely important and facilitating those conversations is a is is challenging can be really challenging yeah, um, i think some of the issue with that is around we framed these dynamics through risk the law people can get into trouble it can all go wrong and then that hostility emerges because it's like that us and them thing, isn't it? You could put me at risk. You're different to me, blah, blah, You know, and actually how can we bridge all of those kind of gender relations and in a much more kind of positive way um, for these yeah, boys and, and men? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And without shutting down the conversations, mm -hmm. I think that is, you know, that is um, trying to do it in a, in a, what we found was most effective was doing it in a non-confrontational way um but putting that into practice you know that can be challenging and it takes you know a great deal of scale we while doing the work that we were doing we you know as i said came into contact with organizations in the uk who have facilitators who are you know trained to open up those uh discussions but you know it, it's difficult um it is yeah. i think like active listening is like so vital it's like yeah i hear what you're saying it all makes sense to me on one level however looking at it from another angle what about this rather than it is unacceptable to say that and and, and reading into that it, yeah yeah so absolutely. the underlying anxiety doesn't go anywhere the yeah. belief system doesn't go anywhere it has to be brought out and then you know pushed back on and looked at in different ways and actually that can be a really positive thing about the participatory process because boys and men can do it to each other and how can we harness that um, yeah, think. absolutely. I know there's somebody um, that has put a question in the chat. Um, I hope um, we can maybe link it in with that, that spoke about um, whether we should be having these conversations in, you know, uh, single gender groups or spaces or whether, um, you know, what what's the value in having it within a, um, a single gender space or a mixed gender space. And I think you know, I'm just thinking about some of the issues that we've just spoken about there. Um, I think there was great value in having, you know, men only spaces or boy only spaces where boys and men can speak about these issues that are specific to their gender, 
to masculinity, to the specific processes within which they've been socialized. Um, I do think, you know, you will have a different dynamic. I don't know what your take on this, uh, Emily, is if you start, you know, mixing gendered groups. It's not to say that you, you know, you will have it, it's going to be another it's going to be another dynamic operating there. Um, it's not to say that, that that can't be of some value. Of course, it can be valuable, but I do think there's great value in in having in these situations and having these conversations about um, issues specific to masculinity within men only or boy only spaces. Yeah, I completely agree um, with that comment. I think, um, yeah, absolutely vital, just as it is that girls and young women need spaces. Yeah, that's we've right. We've recognised that for some time and, and so on. And then I think, but you know, they're mixed gender groups, I think with the appropriate kind of facilitation can then be like yeah. another layer of, you know, how can we understand each other and perspective taking and bringing things together in a bit of a different way yeah so I think both have their place um and have to be carefully facilitated yeah yes yeah. Mm -hmm. thanks very much folks lots to chew on there I might just pass over to my colleague uh, Dr Catherine Baker who's just been examining the questions there and, and any sort of overlapping themes that that we might want to ask before before we finish up um, yeah, so I just wanted to flag one thing that's come up consistently in the chat is just asking about resources specifically for school age boys. And I just uh, linked some into the chat. I'm writing a little description there, but just to flag, it uh, came up several times, uh, the Beyond Equality organization who create resources for um, uh, school age boys, which might be of use for people. Um, which I'll link in the chat. And then another uh, resource that was created by a colleague here in DCU is the Gentopia game, which is a video game format to use in classrooms around uh, issues of gender. And if you found it, gegame.eu, and that's for ages 12 to 16. And then there was a resource created for primary school students around uh, gender roles and starting conversations around uh, gender in the classroom, which is called Gender Equality Matters and can be found at the sphenetwork.ie um, so people might want to and then also I know Fiona uh, linked a resource and a toolkit from any NEU um, about preventing uh, sexism and sexual harassment in schools so um, I'll link them all in the chat with a brief uh, description and age ages um, people might find useful um, and while I'm doing that I might put a question that came up uh, twice to the speakers Two people asked about engaging uh, boys in this work. Uh, one focused outside the classroom, but another talked about how do you engage boys who might not see themselves as uh, needing this information? Or if you're talking about lad culture or something, um, how do you engage boys who might be slightly uh, have kind of tension around that or may not feel like it's relevant to them? Yeah, I found I, so. Yeah, I I found that quite okay to kind of deal with around say um, the consent education because I kind of went into it being like you've all been targeted with this messaging. Mm -hmm. You've all been targeted with some sort of education. You're all picking up on these discourses that are going on around you. I actually want to know how you relate to it. So if you're actually sitting here going, do you know what I know everything I'm doing and I'm sweet. Well, that's great. I want to hear about that and why you think that and what's going on there. And then on the other end of it, yeah, great. And then everything else in between. It's not about how they relate to it. It's the fact that this exists around them and they're going to have a relationship with it. So even if the narrative is that they don't think it's relevant to them, well, that's actually what's interesting. And it's like, unpack that for me. And like with, and that's where it was, um, I was intrigued. Like when I started off the consent stuff, a lot of the boys are like, yeah, we've learned the law. We know what we're doing. Affirmative consent all makes sense all makes sense on paper kind of thing. And, you know, those other horrible boys over there, they're, they're the ones that violate girls. And I was like, oh, all right, then sweet. And my first question always was, was, oh, okay, so do you feel like really confident and happy then when you go like at the idea of like being with a girl or being with a boy or whatever and dealing with this? And all of them just cracked up laughing. And I was like, okay, so what's funny? And that's where you got the like, the breakdown between the knowledge and the reality. And you could start to really unpick that. So I think it's actually the idea of like, if you don't think this matters to you, great, tell me why. And we can go from there because you're still subject to the discourse. You're still subject to the intervention. And then you can find out that it's not quite as black and white as, as the idea that this has nothing to do with me. The opinion will still be there somewhere along the line. 
Yeah, absolutely. Agree with everything you said there. Ultimately, it comes down to tapping into boys or men's self-interest. You know, how can how can they benefit from these discussions? How does it affect them? Um, and that, you know, if there's initial defensiveness or, you know, they're maybe telling you they're not interested, then it's a, you know, it's a question of maybe spending some time with them and, and uh, talking through that asking them about messages they've been exposed to and challenges that, um, that they may be facing and making it relevant, directly relevant to their lives, using language that's very, um, you know, hopefully engaging and in tune with their life experiences. I was particularly struck by the outcome, Emily, you mentioned about uh, at the end, like kind of if we're thinking about outcomes, Often as researchers, we have to evidence what we're doing. I really like the, the sentence you said about boys coming out more confused and that that's OK, that you've facilitated. Um, yeah, and I think um, these gray areas that that, that, that that certainly resonated. with me. And, and that's where the issue around like consent, I think, in particular, like actually we think that if boys walk out the room having ticked all the boxes of knowledge around consent, then that's a great outcome. But I actually think that can be a dangerous outcome. We shouldn't be framing consent as this obtainable thing, as simple as a yes, that's the end of my responsibility on this. I actually think that's a dangerous narrative to be putting out there. We need much more mindful, reflective, empathetic engagements, because otherwise that's where boys will start talking about, do I get my girlfriend to sign a contract? Do I do, you know, if someone sends me an image, then it's therefore what happens next? That very sort of, the law is the law and that's the end of the conversation. I, I think not only can it have no impact, I think it can actually have a harmful impact. And us as the kind of adults and the educators need to think about what might be some of the counterproductive impacts. Unintended, I'm sure, none of us want those outcomes, but that can actually be what unfolds as a result of very rationalistic, this is either relevant to you or it's not, and these are the facts, like way of actually imparting these, these messages. Fantastic. Um, we're just after five after the hour so I always promise not to go too late um, just one thing to mention before we close um, is that we'll be synthesizing all of these toolkits that we've mentioned those that our colleagues have mentioned those that are in the chat uh, as part of the observatory's kind of suite of resources and we will be hoping to be adding to that um, with some ongoing research so we'll certainly update the audience on that and indeed both Fiona and Emily are have been kind enough with their time to sit on a research ad advisory group within the observatory so we're very grateful to them um, and lastly just a huge thanks to Fiona and Emily for offering such time and wisdom on often sensitive topics so so we are very much appreciative of that um, and thank you to the we had about 115 there at, at one moment so it speaks to the interest in this area and certainly Ireland is, I would say, is certainly a bit behind and we are building the, these resources. So your, your wisdom from afar is actually quite instructive. So uh, we will keep keep you in the loop. So thank you. Thank you all for your time and have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, everyone.